Uh, it's good to see you all. Um, oh, hey, back there. Um, just um, some quick announcements. So in a, in a couple weeks' time, we've got, we've got a special weekend uh, in store for us. We've got the Cuba Street Band, Cuba Street Corps. I think they're just bringing the whole core. So I think um, Cuba Street Salvation Army is, is coming up here. They're going to hang out. If you don't know where Cuba Street is, it's down in Wellington. Um, it's the old Wellington City Corps, which is the old Wellington Citadel Corps, which is, that, that was probably its original name. Yeah, um, yeah so they're going to come up in a, in a couple weeks' time. It should be a great weekend. It kicks off Friday night with Recovery Church. You're all more than welcome to come. Uh, and then it's kind of a, a day... Of, of playing in concerts on Saturday. Uh, there's, there's flyers out in the foyer if you want more information. Uh, we're also still looking for billets, so if you have a spare bed or a spare corner, um, it, yeah, I don't know how picky they are about how or where they sleep. So a little shed, a little hut out the back is probably okay. Um, <laughs> Some of you are like, oh, okay, yeah, I can accommodate. I got a dog house. Um, yeah, don't tell them I told you that, but that's, that's all good. So, yeah, look, it's, it's going to be a great weekend. We want to strongly encourage you, you to come. Um, you don't have to be into banding to, to, for it to be an enjoyable weekend. Um, please come. Please find someone else who you think might, might be vaguely interested and bring them along. Um, and, again, I know for me as a, as a young person growing up, uh, in and around music, going to concerts was actually a big kind of shift for me in, oh, this, you can actually make something cool of this. This actually sounds cool. You know, like, then my dad, when I was playing my cornet in my bedroom, he didn't think it sounded cool. But then you go hear a good band play, and you're like, oh, okay, I can aspire to something. Right, Ben? That's how Ben got into it. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of rude jokes that I just can't. Let's keep it moving. Let's keep it moving, Dave, all right? Let's keep it, let's lock it up. Not here. But that's in a couple weekends' time. It's going to be a great weekend. Please come. Please enjoy your time. Uh, and it's also going to be the Sunday morning is going to be a special time where we, where we retire for the, we retire Phil Robertson, but I, I was going to say for the fifth, no, we've been celebrating how old he is for a long time. Um, and, and we've been celebrating how much time and effort he's given to, to the band and to the core here at Fungaday. And so it'll be a special time of remembering that. Um, so it's going to be a great weekend. Please come along. Um, also, look, it, it's, it's with, a, with a sad heart that we, you know, we said goodbye to Arthur Johnson. For those who, who don't know, he passed away last Sunday. Um, he, uh, and we, we had a funeral on, on Thursday and it was actually just a really beautiful time, uh, of remembering. It was a really beautiful time of, I think, I don't know if you can do much with the Johnson family that isn't fun, right? Like, so I think there's this odd thing of it was, it was a really sad time, but it was also, a, it was a fun funeral. And I don't know if I'm allowed to say that into a microphone, but, um, it was a real blessed time. It was a real blessed time of remembering, Arthur and all the things he's done, it's, for me, it's always a really big reminder. Funerals are a big reminder of the legacy that you leave, right? It's a time when we all come together, you know, and, and we've, we've had a few this year. And it's a time where we come together and just remember the impact of someone's life on other people, um, which is just, it's a beautiful thing. I guess, I guess I'd love for us to be better at doing that all the time. Um, I'd like for us to be better, and I guess I'm speaking to myself, I'd like to be better at remembering how important people are to me while they're still with me. Yeah, and I think there's a real special, but it's also look, a special time. Uh, so for those who aren't, weren't aware, Arthur passed away last Sunday. Um, he got sick a couple weeks back, uh, went into hospital, didn't come out. Um, your, your prayers are, are more than more than encouraged for Shirley because she's, she's sick as well. Um, she has the same flu. Um, so keep her in your prayers. Um, and just the, the family and, yeah, all that comes with that. But I guess it's, it, it's, it's I think Arthur's last, last gift to us, it'll probably keep giving, but his last gift to us immediately is, is a chance for us to go, what did he want to be? What does that mean for us? What do we want to be? So that's 
that's going to be the call to worship here this morning. Um, we're going to spend some time. Uh, I, I want to encourage you guys to to spend your morning reflecting between you and God in this company of people um, who you are. Spend some time sitting in, who am I right now? Who am I this week? Who am I today? Who did I wake up deciding I was going to be? Um, really give some thought to that. I also encourage you to really give some thought to, uh, you have that, and then who is it that you feel called to be? So spend some time sitting in this morning of, who am I today, and who do I actually want to be? Who do I feel God has called me to be? What impact has God called me to make on the world and those around me? And if, if you need to think, what do I want people to remember when I'm gone? Uh, and then I'm going to encourage that, I, that we all spend some time this morning sitting with God, going, who am I now? Who do I feel called to be? And how do I get there? And for some of us, it'll be an important question of what's stopping me? Um, for those who, who shared in Recovery Church on Thursday night, Friday night, we had a beautiful time of, of worship together and, and Trevor shared a message and one of, the, one of the questions he asked was, you know, like, what's stopping you from being what you want to be and is it you? Now, I think it's a really important question. What's, what do I want to be? What do I feel God's called me to be? And am I the biggest hindrance to that? It's a really, really important question for us to sit and ponder. There's so much in the Bible that God calls us to sit and wrestle with that question. Am I my biggest problem? Now, if you're not today, congratulations, well done. Like, you're having a good one. But sit and think, God, what's stopping me from being what you called me to be? What's limiting me? How do I get from who I am today to who I feel called by God to become? We'll sit in that, um, and I just encourage that that be where we sit in this morning. So what that might mean for you is a time of, of deep questions about who you are right now. Uh, am I living on purpose? Um, it might mean time of asking God who he created you to be uh, and, and seeking that purpose this morning. Um, it might be, uh, do, you know, the question of, do I know who I'm striving to become more of every day? Uh, this might be a time for us to be honest um, with what's stopping us from becoming who we're called to be. Um, might be a, a, an invitation you're invited this morning to explore who you are who you feel called to be and what's stopping you from getting there. And we invite you, uh, as we just kind of carry on in this time of worship this morning, um, we're just going to play some music. It's, it's a way that I reflect. It's a way that I dig into God. So we just invite you to do the same. Um, we'll invite you to stand up. Uh, we'll dim the lights a little bit. We'll just give you some intimate space to just really dig into who you are this morning and who God's called you to be. Um, this space is always open. This isn't a time-sensitive space. If you need to do business with God this morning, uh, you're invited. All right, do what you need to do. Um, if what you want, you know, like we have, we have our baskets to bring forward your tithes and offerings. If that is a form of worship for you, please feel free to do so. Just whatever you need, need to do to be, to be seeking this space with God this morning. And I also encourage you to, um, you know, make use of the community around us. If you want somebody to pray with you, pray, you know, grab them, drag them, do what you need to do. Um, if you want to pray with someone, go up to them and say, hey, can we spend some time together? But we'll just encourage you to seek God here this morning, seek who he's called you to be, and seek whatever you need to do to get, get a little bit closer here today. So uh, we'll invite you to stand together and we'll just, uh, we'll just join in a time of prayer. So God, we come before you as your people this morning. We thank you for all that you do for us, all that you give to us. We thank you for another day. And God, we come asking you to just do your work in us this morning.
Our prayer this morning is that whatever we bring can be acceptable to you. But God, we selfishly pray that you just do your work in us. Do the work that needs to be done here this morning. God, we bring before you whoever we are today, whatever we are this morning. God, we ask that you speak into us this morning who you've called us to be. Bring to mind right now, God, the people you've put in front of us. speak into us purpose and calling. And Lord, humbly we come and ask you to uh, reveal to us what's stopping us from being the people you called us to be. sing this morning. We're going to lift our praises to you and we're going to ask that you keep speaking to us this morning. And we're going to sing some songs that are, are claiming certain things. Claiming that that we're chosen, not forsaken. for us, not against us, that we're sons and daughters of the Most High God, that we're no longer slaves. We're going to speak Jesus. And for those of us this morning who don't actually feel like we can claim those things, does help us to fake it. Do your work in us this morning, God. Lost by 
God, we, I think we, we claim it whether we feel it or not. God, we just, we're just proclaiming things this morning that we want you to speak into us. And there's certain things we want to be able to claim. Um, for those of us this morning that feel like, yeah, easy. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. That's easy to declare. Thank you for that blessing. And for those of us that feel like that's a struggle, please speak into us, God.
come before you this morning just as we are. Whoever we brought into the room, that's who we bring before you this morning, God. But God, we want to be a people who, uh, who live to whatever you've called us to, whatever the impact you have for us in this world, whatever the impact you have on the people you put in front of us. God, we want to be more like Jesus just a little bit every day. So God, whatever we brought in the room and wherever you want us to be, wherever you've called us to be, God, just speak to us this morning of we want to get there. How do we get there? And we claim this morning that we are children of God. We speak Jesus into the things that might be hindering us. 
whatever it is, God, depression, anxiety, stress, addiction, whatever it is, God, we, we speak Jesus into those things. We ask that you break those things in us this morning. God, our prayer this morning is that you, you don't let us leave not changed. But we also come back to you love us as we walk in. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, God. Thank you that we can claim that we are no longer slaves to fear, but we are children of God. So God, as we carry on this morning, please just continue to do your work in us. Continue to speak to your people. May the words of our mouths, meditations of our hearts, and the things that we bring be acceptable in your sight. You are our Lord, our strength, our redeemer. Amen. What does it mean to live out God's calling in Whangarei here today? So I've asked a few people if they could um, share from their experiences. Uh, so I see Trev there. Thank you so much, Trev. And Ming, could you come forward, please? And we're going to, they've kindly agreed to share some of what it means for them to live in God's calling today. So let's give them some encouragement. Wait. I've got some microphones down here. So I've pre-warned them. They know what questions I'm going to ask. Yeah, perhaps if you stand on the I other travel. side as well. Hello. Yeah. You're on. Just let me know if I need to switch my mic. So three, I've got three questions I'm going to ask these fine people, and just for us to learn a bit more about them, but also perhaps it'll speak into our, our own circumstances a bit about living in God's calling in our own lives. So the first question I've got for you is, um, and I don't mind who goes first, can you just tell us a little bit about your faith journey and perhaps how you came to be in a relationship with God? Age before beauty. Uh, okay, yeah I, yeah. I got this so I don't digress, yeah, so. All right, so uh, I was born, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, kia ora everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, my name is Ming and uh, I, I've been in Whangarei for eight years, came from Singapore. So a bit about my faith journey. Um, I was born into a non-Christian family. Um, some, of, some of my paternal aunts are Christian. So one of them got me enrolled in a Christian mission school for my primary education. So it was during this time that I got saved, around the age of eight or nine, during one of their evangelism weeks. So my aunt also invited me to a church where um, I attended Sunday school. However, um, the non-Christian values at home and, and the Christian teachings at church were like two totally different worlds. And I was also very active and running around church all the time. And I was punished and possibly shamed for it. Uh, yeah, yeah. So when I started high school at age 13, I decided to stop attending church. So fast forward to university. Um, uh, when I was 21, um, I had some sort of crisis. So the Lord brought me back to him. I joined the Varsity Christian Fellowship where I grew in the knowledge of God's Word, began serving Him, and this was also when I felt the Lord calling me to the mission field. Um, graduated from engineering school during the 2001 recession, I was seeking the Lord for direction in my vocation and area of service in church, and the leading was in the area of young people. So He led me into teaching. I thought this would be good preparation uh, with the mission field in mind. Um, and in the youth ministry I was serving in, we were very blessed as um, the Lord showed up in a very powerful way over a period of time. Uh, my encounter with the Holy Spirit changed the way I viewed God and my faith. I later got married, and um, some years down the road, I felt the Lord prompting me to make a move to New Zealand. Um, so, and that was like, yeah, I was like, are you sure, God? You know, like, <laughs> really? Um, it, but, but after a while, it got pretty serious, so yeah. So, so I came without a job, and after a long job search of about six months, um, the only job opening was in Whangarei, and, and I had told the Lord that I would do any job at teaching, so I'm, here I am, I'm a teacher, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's all I got for this question. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much for being here. Trev? Um, so I went to Wesley College for about eight years, and so we had um, morning church, 
five days a week and two uh, services on a Sunday. Um, so I suppose the seeds were sowing back then, but man, it was kind of put me off going to church, actually. And so I, I became more of a hippie. And uh, then uh, I discovered this, or what I thought at that time was this magical formula of drugs, uh, marijuana, some a little bit harder. And so for about 30 years, I was um, just living a drug lifestyle, uh, fully functioning, was working at the IRD as a GST auditor, income tax auditor, and all doing all of that. But, you know... There's a few times I went out on audits and I was like stoned off my face. Um, and I suppose as I um, grew a bit older, it started to affect um, my family. We had kids. And so I got to that point in my life where I kind of, um, well, actually, yeah. so I tried to stop a couple of times and uh, Gloria will tell you that I literally grew horns when I did because I had no kind of coping mechanism, no strategy, just go cold turkey and it'll be all good. And then one day I went to the Ngunguru Medical Centre and I met um, Annie there. And uh, Annie goes, uh, do you need some uh, patches for smoking? I said, oh, have you got patches for that green smoke? And she, <laughs> and she goes, well, actually, I know someone down at the bridge... Uh, who's a, a you know, real strong woman, and I think it would be great for you to talk to her. So uh, that was Hannah Seddon. So I ended up going down to the bridge straight away, met Hannah. Uh, she was my case worker for about two months before I actually went on the bridge program. Went on the bridge program, really loved it. Um, I loved the way I was treated for and cared for. And... Um, Started learning the steps, got to step three, and it was about giving your um, heart, your addiction, and your life over to the Lord Jesus. Um, and so I got to that point where I was at home, and I just went, Lord, I've had enough. I give you my addiction. I give you everything. And then just like that, bang, uh, free from the addiction to drugs. Uh, yeah, come on. I had to work through my mental and emotional addictions, of course. And there was quite a few of those. Um, but it was that, that that started my journey to um, become a follower of Jesus. And I'm um, eternally grateful for that opportunity for uh, the people involved. And then, um, yes, I've been a member of the core ever since then. Kia ora. Kia ora. I should ask, there was one other person who was willing to speak this morning, but um, unfortunately Barb is unwell and unable to be here, but my thanks to Barb for her willingness as well. Thank you both for what you've shared already. So the second question, uh, I'm going to do a bit of a preface. Now, one of the things we do in our society is we introduce someone and we say, hey, this is Bob. Bob is a mechanic. Or we introduce someone and then explain what they, their job, like it defines who they are. So this next question is, what do you understand about who God has created you to be? But of course, we've got to make a distinction between the job or the work that we do or have done isn't the same thing as who God has created you to be. God hasn't created you to be someone who stacks supermarket shelves, for example. So what do you understand about who God has created you to be? Um, well, first and foremost... Uh, I'm a child of God, I'm a beloved child of God, and um, that, in a nutshell, determines who I am. Um, but I also uh, have been on a journey, and so Acts 17 verse 26, uh, where I am, uh, God appointed me here in New Zealand at this time as a Māori, um, and so I'm here um, uh, to really look at what does it mean for your cultural identity in Christ? Mm. Who are you as a Māori? Who are you as a Christian? And I've had 
some Māori fa- whānau going, uh, you know, that doesn't really blend with the Christian uh, culture. And then I've had some Christian mm. whānau goes, well, you know, your Māori culture should be over there. You're a Christian. And so um, different perspectives, wide-ranging uh, thoughts. And so the journey uh, for me has been, well, who am I? Mm. And what does the Lord really want for me? Um, so I am, I am a Māori Christian. That's who I am. Um, what does that look like? Um, how should you act? And so for me, there's no um, Christianity and Māori blend together. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's certainly aspects of Māori, uh, Māoridom and even um, history of the Christians, I suppose, that, you know, there's always that bits and pieces that aren't, don't quite sit well. And so it's about um, navigating through that to find out actually who does God really say you are and what do you need to do. So um, I've been around the mountain about 50, 100 times to kind of get to this place where I'm happy to be Māori, Mm. I'm happy to be Christian, and if I can... Um, uh, not demonstrate, but if I can show fa- our Māori Fano that there is a different way of, um, you know, leaving the past behind, leaving all the corridor around the missionaries and stuff like that, and get to that place where actually it's a personal relationship with God. That's who you are. That's who you were born to be. Uh, no reira, kia ora. Kia ora. I read the question like quite differently to Trevor. But, That's good. Um, That's good. Uh, well, I think um, where I'm coming from is like you know I look at my children and you know like from the moment they're born they have very distinct personalities. You know their temperament. You know that it's a, it's a God-given kind of like like when Andre was born, I knew he was just fiery, you know, and 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 really strong. Well, you know, so so what do I understand? Um, so I, I look back. At, at like who who I was um, back then, and uh, I think I, I was incredibly shy as a kid uh, in in school in my early years. I and I can still remember very clearly some instances of being bullied, um, and I often wondered why I was like different. So I remember this story that uh, my mom told me uh, when I was a little bit older. She said, um, "Well, when when I was young, I was watching this movie. Um, I think it was probably titled Shoes, uh, which was I think the original film was." Uh, uh, was filmed in Iran, I think. And I think this was in the 70s. And there was this little kid who dropped his shoes in the stream and float, uh, the shoes were floating away. And then he was chasing it and he couldn't get it back. So I, uh, my mom told me that I just cried and asked her to get it for, for her. So, and, and, and I clearly remember this story. Um, and and gives, this gives me an insight to an, uh, this aspect of how God has created me to feel things very deeply. Um, I, I went to an old boys uh, primary school. I also went to an old boys uh, high school. That's uh, like the, like the, yeah, ten years in the same school, pretty much. And 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 I was a really really puny kid. Like I was really small in size. Um, so to put it in perspective, you know, um, if you've seen Andre around, he's not here today, but he's eleven years old and he's like 146 centimeters. So it's pretty tall. Um, when I was thirteen, I remember um, I was one hundred and thirty nine point five. So I, I couldn't, yeah, so, so I was like, no, I want to be 140. Oh, and then that, that point 0.5 still hurt, that's why I remember that. Um, uh, a, yeah, sorry. Uh, la, 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 la. Oh no, got lost. Um, yeah, so I decided I, I didn't want to be soft and small and, and a target uh, in a possibly very unkind environment in a large boys' school, um, more than a thousand. Um, so I chose, I chose to join the police cadets where I could toughen up physically. So, so for a lot of my teenage years and a lot of my uh, young adult years, I, I hid behind a tough exterior, you know, um, most of those that time. Uh, but back to that question, um, who, like, what has God made me to be? I, I feel very, I'm someone who feels very deeply. I can connect with young people. Um, I can sense when people are hurting I, and I want to help them, but sometimes it just feels overwhelming. So, so that's, that's what I understand from this question. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much.
And then this leads into the last question, which is, what does it mean for you to live out this calling on your life? Out of that identity God's made you to be, and the calling is put on you, what does that look like for you? And we're not, again, we're not just talking about the things you do at work. We're talking about, we're talking about our life. Thank you. My turn? All right. Okay. Yeah. So <coughs> what does it mean to live out God's calling in my life? Um, so in, in the early years of my journey with God, um, I think this was, uh, I think when I came back to him uh, in university, when I was about 21, um, I thought it was by doing lots of stuff, you know, lots of things in church, you know, uh, in, in the fellowship. And I was very involved in the youth church in different roles. I was involved in prayer ministry, led uh, youth group, went on mission trips to explore my mission's calling. Uh, I trained and led youth teams on mission trips. Um, however, I didn't take care of myself. That led to me being burning out. Yep. So, um, yeah. And, and during my time serving in the youth ministry, God was moving in a very powerful way. And one of the most important lessons I learned uh, was that God speaks and we can hear him if we would listen. So he answers even the simplest prayers prayed by young people. And, and, and that was very encouraging because, like, you know, we, we encourage the young people to pray and then we were seeing answers to prayer, you know, like, like testimonies. And that was amazing. Um, and, and this set up the stage later on when I sensed the Lord prompting me to make a move uh, to New Zealand over a sustained period of time. Um, so I'm, I'm here. Um, but I also have questions, you know, why, mm. like, why did God lead me all the way here to be in my current situation? So uh, for those of you guys who don't know, I, uh, my marriage failed, um, and yeah, so, so why, you know? So what happened to my mission's calling, you know? And sometimes I ask myself, why am I even here? Um, and, and I could try to rationalize, like, uh, possible reasons, you know, in my own understanding of things, you know, try and explain things myself, but, but at present, I have no clear answers, yeah. So... What does it mean to live out God's calling? I'm, I'm aware of my gifts and my skills and who I am. I'm currently not in a space where I can be constantly serving in the ministry regularly, you know. And for me right now, it's important to connect with the Lord regularly and to respond in obedience when He speaks, when I hear Him speaking, or when I yeah, think I hear Him speaking. Um, in terms of my priorities, um, my children are my priority right now. Um, I want to be the best father I can to be them. Uh, yeah, I can be to them. Uh, I want to walk with them and help them to grow, uh, to know the Lord and to grow in their faith journey. And I'm, I am enjoying them. And this is one of the reasons why I came to New Zealand, uh, to, to have more time to enjoy my children. So making my decisions day by day, um, taking things one step at a time, uh, that's how I'm, yeah, that's how I'm um, living out my calling, I guess. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I probably struggled a little bit at this question because I was wondering which calling. Um, with my passion and enthusiasm for things, um, I've had multiple callings. Um, so, um, and then sometimes I'm going like, come on, come on, God, catch up with me. Come on, do you need a hand? So the callings that I thought I had were... Um, Partly his, a lot of mine. So I probably had to go through um, a few things uh, around um, listening more, uh, hearing from him. I think the last couple of years for me have really uh, demonstrated to me that um, my flesh is calling is to be a child of God, to be his son and um, live his ways. And so, I've, um, yeah, it's been a struggle the last couple of years, but in that struggle, it's also been about the Lord just stretching me, yeah, to breaking point on a few time, a few occasions. But it's more about um, Him looking at me and just going, uh, rest in me, slow down in me, um, whatever will be, will be. You just need to listen to me and act and do when I say. And so uh, I think that slowing down and being more in him uh, has really, um, oh, yeah, I think that's my calling. Um, I've been able to, uh, I still get quite stressed and running around at work, so I'm not flitting like I used to, so I used to be there. 
So I'm not doing that as much, but I still can do it. So that's part of my thing is just to slow down. And it's all good. Things are going to happen. Um, and it's just responding and talking um, in his way rather than the way I used to do things. So, um, I, yeah, I think for me, my calling is just to be a son of God, just to listen and... Um, I suppose at the end of the day, it's around being an obedient son. Kia ora. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you both. I've got nothing to add to what you said, but I'd just like to pray with you both before you head back. So let us pray. Uh, Father God, I want to thank you for, for Trev and Ming and for Barb, who's unable to be here. Thank you for their, um, who they are, who you've created them to be for their willingness to share um, with us here this morning, um, their, their vulnerabilities, their journeys, their questions. I pray that you'd uphold them and bless them, and thank you for the blessing that they've been to us as they've shared from their hearts. So pour out your spirit on them, Father. May they live out in their calling day by day. May they grow in knowledge of you, and may that spirit of you just impact everything and everyone that they come across. Pray in the name of Jesus. Lots there for us to think on, I guess, over the, as we think on that interview over the coming days. And God can speak to us through people's stories as well, I firmly believe that. And on the subject of stories, we're going to watch the, this week's self-denial video in just a moment. So next week is what we call our self-denial altar service. It's the opportunity where we can bring our uh, gifts of, of money towards this mahi um, overseas. So um, just to put that before you. But also, if you're unable to be here next week, there's around about a month's cutoff um, for you to contribute to this, to this fund for overseas mission. You can give online, but there's also envelopes in the foyer. So if you haven't done, I invite you to take one of those and prayerfully consider what God is calling you to give. But let's take a look at this week's video. I live in the village of Sivi Tatana in Papua New Guinea. I am a wife and a mother of eight children. The Salvation Army Corps has been open for 13 years here, and we use the all for many community gatherings. Six months ago, our Corps officer started the Sivi Tatana Fellowship Adult Literacy Program, and I was very happy to join. It's free to attend and welcome to everyone. Like most people in the villages, we live off the land and it is near impossible for us to afford school fees in every season. Many children miss out on education, especially girls, myself included. When my father got sick, I stopped attending school at 10 years old to help at home. 40 local community members have joined the adult literacy program, mostly women who have missed out on schooling and are eager to learn. Every Monday and Thursday, Captain Mizina teaches the group how to read and write English through phonics and games. We encourage each other and have become great friends. When I first joined, I could not read or write. Now, I teach my children to read and write, and they teach me things they have learned too. I love that I can read the Bible together with my family. I never imagined this could happen before. 
The Salvation Army has done so much for our community, and I am happy to serve as a soldier, only treasurer, and a leader in Women's Fellowship. I'm so grateful for the program and want to say thank you to the officers and the Salvation Army. I have two grandchildren now, and being part of this program gives me hope for our community, and especially our children. The Salvation Army Citizen Fellowship is an adult literacy program empowering the community. We have been teaching adults who have left out on the basic education. Projects like this are funded through self-denial mission support funding. And therefore, I appeal to everyone to give a gift from your heart for this year's self-denial appeal. Thank you and God bless. Now this morning, predictably, we're continuing our journey through Acts, or into chapter 18. But before we go any further, it's really important that we remember where we've come from. Everything today that I'm going to say hangs on basically what we talked about last week. So if you were here last week, can we call out some of the things that we remember uh, Nathan talking about? Aha. Idolatry, yep. And related to idolatry would be, or the opposite of idolatry, perhaps? <coughs> worship. True worship. So last week was Paul in Athens, all the idols to all these gods around the place, and Paul was concerned because where's the true worship of the one true God? Everything about who God is, everything about him, he is the one alone that we worship. Now, everything I'm going to say this morning all hangs on the idea of God is the one we worship. He's worthy of worship, um, the person of who God is. Now, this week, we're following on as Paul heads to the city of Corinth. And what we're going to see is how the years of opposition kind of catch up with him. They have an effect, unsurprisingly. But the ultimate theme of today is how Paul could only fully live in God's calling when he allowed God to transform his fear. And so we're going to take some time to wonder what that might look like for us today as well. All right, so Corinth. It was one of the most important cities Paul visited. It was the Roman capital of its province, which means it was a great place for the gospel to then spread around the surrounding region. Some people described it as more Roman than Rome itself. But overall, the city had a reputation for immoral indulgence. But we're going to dive right into Acts chapter 18 and see what happens when Paul comes to town. Here we go, Acts chapter 18, verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius, the emperor, had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. So in the first century, rabbi were expected to do their religious work for free. They needed a way to support themselves. And so we learn here that Paul did that by making tents, which means he would have used uh, leathers, Goat's skin probably as well, goat's hair to make tents. And I had this question, doesn't that make him unclean? Well, it can't do because he's a, he's a Pharisee. But um, if we think back, we met Simon the Tanner in the city of Joppa quite a few weeks ago. And he did a role considered unclean in tanning and curing the skins. So when someone like Paul works with the skin, it's no longer considered unclean. So Paul had this kind of tent-making posse, and this is the way they supported and made a living for themselves. Meanwhile, the mission goes on, as we see in verse 4. Every Sabbath, Paul reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. 
Okay, so it seems at this point that Silas and Timothy arrive with a gift of money from the Macedonian church. And now Paul doesn't need to work to support himself. He can exclusively focus on his ministry. As an interesting side note, this is the last time we see Silas mentioned in Acts. On to verse 6. But when they, the Jews, opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Does that whole pattern sound a bit familiar? That's what we've seen a number of times in Acts. This Paul's standard operating procedure. Go to a new place, go to the synagogue, and then when you get rejected by the Jews, go to the Gentiles. And then this is the second time where he does this gesture of shaking off dust, a sign he makes against the Jews. This is usually a sign Jews made toward Gentiles. You're unclean, you're not God's people. But Paul makes this gesture to the Jews. Actually, you are the ones who have rejected God. You're no better than the Gentiles you despise. Into verse 7. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshipper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. So just a continuing theme of belief and unbelief that we keep seeing. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Okay, I want to spend a bit of time on those verses, on that vision we've just read. If you think about Paul, it's fair to say he's been through a lot at this point. We could list some stuff and I'm sure we'd miss it. He's been arrested, he's been put in jail, he's been lashed, he's been stoned to the point where people thought he was dead. He's had severe illness on the journey. He's had companions desert him on the road. I think it's not all that surprising to think that Paul was experiencing fear at this point. Right? It kind of seems fair enough with all that that's been going on. And he gets to Corinth, and then the Jews in Corinth start becoming abusive to him. I think we'd understand if he's in a bit apprehensive, what's going to happen to me now? In fact, if we read the letter of 1 Corinthians, in chapter 2, Paul says, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. So Paul's got a bit going on. And it's in this time of Paul's fear and trembling that he gets this vision from God. In this time of need, God speaks directly to the fear that is actually a threat to his whole ministry. Now you see, the problem with fear is the effect it has. Fear is what produces the freeze, fight or flight response. The whole rabbit in the headlines. In the headlines? In the headlights. Um, I mean, something else. The, this, it's, it causes us to be focused on our own self-preservation. Fear is, I've got to keep myself safe and protected from this thing. Paul's ministry is about reaching out and serving others. So fear is a very real danger to the ministry which he is called to. So at this time where he most needs to hear it, God speaks to him. Do not be afraid. I am with you. And he gives this promise, you're not going to be attacked and harmed. Now if we look across the whole Bible, fear is one of those things which appears time and time and time again. Do not fear is the command God most speaks to his people. Just to name a few, the angel Gabriel speaking to Mary, Jesus' mother, or speaking to Joshua in the Old Testament. It's spoken to the entire Israelite people at one point. If you read and turn to almost any psalm, there's a reference to not having fear because God is there. Psalm 23 would be a classic example. Many parts of Scripture talk about fear. Fear is obviously really important for God to address then. That would be a fair conclusion, I think. 
And if we turn to the book of Hebrews, we actually see that the writer of this letter, he talks about Jesus' ministry in terms of breaking the slavery that fear causes. He talks about Jesus in a way that fear is so important that Jesus' ministry was to come and break the fear. If we'll take a look briefly at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Since the children of God have flesh and blood, he, Jesus Christ, shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. So Christ has come to free us from slavery, to fear, the fear of death and everything related to it. Praise God. But that's not the only content of Paul's vision. So Paul says to him, do not be afraid, I'm with you, do not fear. But he also tells him, keep doing what I've called you to do. Don't be silent, keep speaking, keep speaking to the Gentiles. And the way he speaks this vision contains a promise for Paul's ministry. He says, I have many people in this city. Well, the way that's written kind of indicates that these people are not yet followers of Jesus. Your ministry is going to be effective, Peter, uh, Paul. Keep going. And then we read, Paul stays and ministers in Corinth for a year and a half. That's almost twice the length of his entire first missionary journey. So God transforms Paul's fear. He reminds him, I am with you. And when Paul is free from his fear, he ministers out of his connection with God. He ministers out of his identity as a calling, as a proclaimer of the gospel to the Gentiles. And we have a year and a half of transformation in Corinth through his ministry. But we're about to see it's not that the Jews didn't try to get at Paul. And I think my reflection would be what we're about to read, that the Jews who didn't believe were very much actually living in their own fear and responding out of the fear that they held. So we'll go to chapter 18 of Acts, verse 12. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Now this is another great place to ask those why questions that Nathan was encouraging a couple of weeks ago. Why would the Jews go to the Roman proconsul with this charge? So there's a likelihood that this is based around uh, a special exemption the Jewish people came under, the Jewish exemption. So imagine you're the emperor of a large empire spanning the, most of the known world. You face threats all the way around your empire. There's people groups who are trying to attack and get what you've got. People you want to subdue and maybe even conquer to add to your empire. So the last thing you need, if you're doing this, is to have conflict within the empire. You don't want to be spending resources and time dealing with people who are supposed to be your people because you need to spend that time outwards. And so the Romans put into play all these policies which leads to what's called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And there was this 200-year period of prosperity and peace within the Roman Empire. Now, one of these policies to, to keep the peace was the Jewish exemption. So the Romans conquer Israel, and the Jews just won't adhere to that rule. You've got to worship all the Roman gods, because the Jews believe there is only one God, and it's wrong to worship anyone else. And so stubborn are the Jews about this rule that the Romans realize, you know what, it's just easier if we don't have to enforce this rule on them. We'll let them worship their God in their way. We won't force them to do what everyone else has done. The compromise, they've got to pay taxes to Caesar. They've got to support the empire financially, and we won't worry about their worship. In Corinth, the largest city, the largest temple in the city, 
was actually devoted to the ruling family. So Roman citizens weren't only expected to worship and pray to other gods. They were expected to pray to the emperor. And so the Jews would be pretty keen to keep this exemption that they've got to themselves. But then along come these Jews, and these, sorry, the, the Christians, and the Christians claim to come under this same exemption to worship just the one God. And these are the Christians who have seen riots and opposition sprout up wherever they go in the empire. I mean, usually from the Jews, but we won't, let, we won't put that past the Jews here. We read as well at the start of chapter 18 that the Emperor Claudius ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. It's likely that this was because of a similar situation where the, the gospel comes and then there's strife between the Jews and the Christians. So much so that the Jews are ordered to leave Rome. And this is a problem for the Jews because if this rule is about keeping the peace, you have this special rule, you don't need to worry about what everyone else has done, we want to keep the peace. And then the Christians come along and there's strife. Well, what's everyone else going to do? Why have they got this special rule? It's about keeping the peace, right? Well, it's not exactly causing, having the result we want it to have. Why should the Jews have a special rule and no one else does? And so I think the Jewish claim to the proconsul is out of this fear of losing this status that they enjoy. And so they make this legal claim and they want them to basically outlaw the Christians. And we see what Gallio has to say in verse 14. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. So God is also keeping his promise to Paul at this point. You're not going to come to harm. But then the crowd turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, who was a partner of Paul, we learn from 1 Corinthians, and beat him in front of the proconsul. And Gallio showed no concern, whatever. So the Jews take Gallio at his word, and they perform the standard synagogue punishment on their leader while he stands by. Gallio, remember, he wants to keep the overall peace, and he judges the best course of action is to not get involved with the Jewish affairs. And the result is, of course, that the Christians can enjoy this freedom to worship exemption, at least for the time being, that the Jews have. Okay, on to verse 18. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Kencray because of a vow he had taken. Now, Luke doesn't take time to explain what this vow is. His audience probably knew exactly what he was talking about. We can only make best guesses, however. So in the Jewish culture, vows had kind of one of two significances. They were either a vow you took with God for him to bless you going forward, or a vow of kind of thankfulness for what God has done in your life. So given Paul's vision that he had in Corinth and the fruitful time he had, it seems that Paul took this vow of thankfulness. He took this temporary Nazarite vow, he wouldn't have drunk alcohol, and he wouldn't have cut his hair over this time. And what you do at the end of such a vow is you shave your head, and then you go to Jerusalem and offer a sacrifice at the temple. So Paul is thankful for God's vision and his deliverance, and he marks the end of his vow, and then, as we're about to see, he indeed does head to Jerusalem. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went to the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus 
When he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and presumably went to the temple and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. And just like that, Paul's secondary missionary journey has come to a close four years after it began. But I want to double back and focus once more on this idea of calling and fear. Because if we think back to Paul's younger days, when we first saw him in Acts, he thought his role was to defend Judaism from heresy. He saw himself as a defender of the Jews. That's why he persecuted the church. But he had this encounter on the road to Damascus with Jesus. And this encounter completely flipped his life upside down. His true calling was revealed as something he would never have imagined. His calling wasn't to defend Judaism. It was to defend the Gentiles, to rescue and defend the Gentiles by the Spirit. And this transformation in Paul's understanding of what God was calling him to led him to travel many roads, to suffer many times, And so it's no wonder that fear came out of some of his experiences. And it took this vision for Paul to remind, be reminded by God, Christ has freed you from your fear. And then with being freed from his fear, he fully lived in his calling to the Corinthian Gentiles. Again, if you look in the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul writes that death is the result of sin. Death is the result of being disconnected from God, who is, after all, the source of life. Which means we can think of sin in a way as the outcome of living in fear. Fear is why so many relationships are broken. The Corinthian Jews were faced with the truth of Christ, but they were feared losing their status and their freedom to worship in Roman society. And they missed out on the fullness of life in God. Fear is one of those things which can grow in us as well if we're not careful. We live in a world caught up in fear. Uh, We've got the election coming up, and just see how many times over the next few weeks where we see policies announced that play on people's fears about what's going to happen. And fear can also grow from other legitimate sources. Our lived experiences, like Paul, can grow fear in us the experiences of those around us. Even though he's lost, the devil tries to keep us in slavery to fear. Our fears will try and hold us back in shame. But if we confess our fears to God and others, then the Spirit's power is to break the power of the fear over us. Yeah, amen. And so as I was reflecting for this morning, I was like, I think I'm holding on to some fears myself. Fears of losing people. Fears of being a failure, of being inadequate. You might be aware of some fears that you hold as well. So the question is, what if we allow God to transform these fears inside us? What if we hand it over to him and choose to live in his freedom? God says, do not fear. I am with you. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. What if we choose to accept this? What if I choose to hand over my fear of loss to God and I don't take it back again? Because I think we can be good at doing that too. Paul's ministry flourished when he allowed God to transform his fear. What if we do the same? And What if we take an opportunity this morning as well um, to do that? And so I've asked Nathan if he can play through and sing the song again, I'm no longer a slave to fear. And so I want to finish this morning with an invitation. And the invitation is to basically acknowledge, confess our fears before God, maybe with one another. Perhaps come to a place of prayer where you sat or at the front. I've also got these pieces of paper and pens at the front. And one thing you might like to do as a symbol of um, leaving your fear with God is write your fear on a piece of paper and then screw it up and place it in one of the bins at the side of the room. 
and then we leave them there with God. So if that's helpful for you, that's something which you can do this morning as a way to symbolize giving over our fears to God, letting it go, because we want to live in his perfect love and we want to live out the fullness of who he has called us to be. And finally, there's no time limit here. There's not going to be any formal end to this meeting. Please feel free to move out to the foyer at any point or to stay here in this room. Just ask that you're respectful of what's going on in the room around you. So let us pray. Father God, we commit ourselves to you in this time. Have your way by the power of your spirit, I pray. Amen. God bless you.
So oh.